a little after midnight, we started uh, hearing explosions and missiles uh, all over Israel. Okay, more than 200 ballistic missiles were launched from Iran and its proxies towards Israel. And this is just the beginning. According to IDF officials, a second wave is expected to hit Israel very soon. At the moment, 99% of these missiles were intercepted by the Aaron Dome anti-rocket defense systems, the Aero defense systems, and basically Israeli Air Force defenses, as well as our allies in the Middle East, including Jordan, including the United States and other countries that have been helping us in this war against Iran. But uh, this is not the end. Iran launched more than 200 uh, drones that are sent to Israel. Every drone takes about eight hours to reach Israel from Iran. So this war is still ongoing. The whole country is basically alert and awake all night. Everybody has bomb shelters. I have my bomb shelter right uh, below this, uh, this balcony. My kids are in it and we are ready and waiting for, uh, for the alarms and to get inside. But like, uh, like you just said, listen, Israel is at war for our survival. And this war is fought on multiple fronts. We were fighting in the Gaza Strip, but it's all connected. This is one big war against Israel. We cannot have a ceasefire with Hamas before we deal with the terrorist organizations. We need to destroy Hamas and to show this entire region that Israel can defend itself and that nobody should mess with Israel, especially during this time. We are fighting for our lives and we've done it before. Israel unites and God is on our side and we will win this war. We are all praying to that end, Yair. Yeah, stay with us. Uh, I want to bring in Eric Steckel back, who was supposed to be uh, hosting, but we had some technical difficulties out of the studio. Eric, uh, welcome and glad you can uh, join us and get the technical things out of the way. Let's hope that Israel is not going to have any technical difficulties in dealing with Iran. Yeah, Governor, great to be with you and great point here. I think the big question is, okay, unprecedented attack by Iran, no doubt, requires an unprecedented response. That's what Israeli officials are saying, Governor. And look, everyone now, number one, as Yair just said, we are waiting for that, sadly, another wave of Iranian drones and missiles. But how will Israel respond? Governor, I think Iran has opened a window here, opened a door, which it probably didn't intend to do, where Israel now has carte blanche in a sense. Look, the first ever attack launched from Iranian soil towards the state of Israel, not through proxy this time, although the proxies are involved as well, but directly from Iran, and this gives Israel an opening. Look, Iran is a sovereign nation, a member of the UN, so is Israel, it's mano y mano now, and Israel has an opening and every right in the eyes of the so-called international community to strike back against Iran. It's almost a golden opportunity, Governor. And finally, look, this is the head of the snake, the Iranian regime. We have this ring of fire, these Iranian proxies that surround Israel on all sides. But rarely has the Iranian regime paid any consequences since 1979 when this radical regime took power. And now is a chance for Israel to finally hold the head of the snake, Iran, accountable. So it's going to be a very busy night in Israel as we pray for the people of Israel, of course, sheltering in place and and taking refuge from the ongoing Iranian barrage. But how will Israel respond? That's a big question. And I'm encouraged to see, look, the UK, the US, of course, but Jordan and Saudi Arabia, two Sunni Arab Muslim nations, stepping into the void here, stepping into the breach and helping to down these incoming Iranian projectiles. I think that is huge to see. You see the region really shaping up where you have on one side the Iranian axis, those radical terrorist forces, but on the other side, Israel and the moderate Arab nations, the moderate Sunni Muslim nations like Saudi Arabia, like Jordan, the UAE, Egypt. So the state of play is set right now in the Middle East, and we are all watching the next several hours to see the continued Iranian provocations and, most importantly, Israel's response. 
You know, I think, Eric, uh, your assessment is very accurate, especially in that maybe Iran completely just was misguided into thinking that the world would all step back, uh, almost like they have been in these last few weeks dealing with Gaza, and that they would all sort of say, hey, we're not going to get involved. But this is not the same. This is the big schoolyard bully who has decided to step into the fight. And this isn't the weakling kid who's just kicking no, sand I at somebody. There for a second. Can uh, when, okay, I, I, you may not be able to hear everything, but uh, Iran clearly has decided that it wants to play ball in the big leagues. And that's what they're doing. They're swinging the bat and they're swinging for the fences. Can anyone hear me? But they may end up going out with three strikes because what you've mentioned, the fact that the Jordanians, the Saudis, as well as European nations like France and the UK, have clearly sided with Israel. And what we have to do is to hope that the U.S., while they're saying the right things tonight, and I'm grateful for that, and I hope Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken will continue to stay strong. Um, but so far, there has been a unanimous sense among uh, what I would call the civilized nations of the world against the most uncivilized. And I'm told that we've lost Eric. So, Yair, are you, if you're still with me, I want to go back to you because we were talking a moment ago and you brought up ballistic missiles. Uh, surely the drones, which take eight or nine hours to get to Israel, but ballistic missiles can get there in about an hour and a half. So it's a much different calculus, uh, a very different kind of threat if ballistic missiles are in fact on their way and are being intercepted. Are, are you able to confirm that ballistic missiles have uh, entered the airspace of Israel? Yes, thank you. According to the IDF reports, ballistic missiles were intercepted in this uh, first wave of attacks by the Israeli uh, anti-missile and anti-rocket defense system. Yes, I can confirm that. But at the moment, we are still waiting for more missiles, for more attacks, either from uh, the proxies and especially from Iran. But like Eric said, this is an opportunity for Israel to cut off the head of the snake. And I believe that if it use it, and the prime minister and the IDF stated that the Israeli response is going to be very harsh against this attack. We will not take this line down. And this is an opportunity for us to deal with one of our biggest enemies in this region. And this is not just an Israeli enemy. This is an enemy of all the Western world and the United States. This enemy is spreading yeah, I think terror and funding it throughout this region. Yes. And I think a lot of Americans need to remember that the Iranians have said repeatedly that Israel is the little Satan, but the United States is the great Satan. So any American who says, well, this is all fine and good, it's happening in Israel, let's hope they do okay, but it doesn't affect us, I would say you're quite wrong. If Iran is not stopped in Israel, if it doesn't end there, it comes to us, because that's what the Iranians have been saying for the past 44 years. And we need to take it seriously when someone says our goal is to wipe all of you off the face of the earth, which is exactly the reason that they yes. have been wanting to build up and acquiesce and uh, obtain nuclear weapons. Uh, speak, Yair, if you could, to the spirit of the Israeli people. I know it's 4.30 in the morning in Israel. No one is sleeping. Everyone is wide awake. I hope folks will be able to get a little rest because this is not going to end immediately. Uh, but is the resolve of the Israeli people strong and prepared uh, for doing whatever it takes to put an end to this Iranian threat? Yes, definitely. I can personally speak to the resolve of the Israeli people. I've served for four months in this war after the 7th of October, two months in the border with Lebanon and another two months inside Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip. And the people of Israel and all the soldiers of the IDF and their families back at home are united. And sadly, what unites us is when an enemy comes to destroy us. And this is throughout 
history and also back to the biblical times when an enemy wants to destroy the state of Israel, we unite and we're together and we're ready to do whatever it takes in order to defend our families. Listen, the IDF is made out of fathers, out of mothers who have jobs. This is not their main profession, but they all have a bag. I have a bag, I have a boots and all my equipment. And whenever we are called, we go to our bases and we defend our country. This is what we've been doing forever. And this is what we've been doing, especially since the 7th of October. And this is what we're doing now. And we will not stop. And we want to defend ourselves. We want to be active. As you were speaking, I thought there was a great irony in that in the background, I could hear the uh, uh, call to prayer coming out of the Muslim minarets, some of which had those drones been successful and not been interrupted, probably would have been silenced, ironically, by their own people in Iran. And I'm hoping that the world wakes up to the news that it was the Israelis who saved those mosques, including their third most holy site, the al Ask uh, Mosque, there on the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. uh, right at the Dome of the Rock. And had the Iranians destroyed that, they might have invoked not just the uh, mere sort of defense mechanisms of the Jordanians, the Egyptians, and the Saudis, but a full-scale military launch for having done something that would have been considered not only a military disaster, but a religious sacrilege. Would that have been seen that way? Yes, yes definitely. Listen, they, their hatred towards Israel and towards the Jewish people is bigger than their religion and is bigger than their faith because they're launching missiles above the head of Al-Aqsa, which is the third holiest site in Islam, above Jerusalem, above the heads of Palestinians, above the heads of Israeli Arabs and Israelis together. They hate us more than they love their own people or their religion. And this is an enemy that you cannot reason with. You cannot negotiate. Their whole goal is to annihilate the state of Israel. And we need to know that and we need to act that way. Another very important thing to mention is that this is the Middle East. People react to actions and not to statements and not to words. So this goes also to all of our allies. If you want to help us in this war, please act and do not just speak and state good things in your uh, televisions and media. We need action at this moment in order to defend ourselves here in Israel. Yeah, I, uh, I almost hesitate to ask you to stand by, but I would appreciate it if you could stand by because you're on the ground there in Israel. You are hearing everything mm -hmm. that, uh, that we are hearing about. You're hearing it in person. I understand uh, Eric Stackelbeck is back with us. Eric, are you, uh, are you able to join us again? I am, Governor. I think there might be some Iranian regime gremlins in the studio right now trying to cut our feed, but we are here. And look, Yair, first of all, great frontline coverage that we have at TBN to have our TBN Israel correspondent, Yair Pinto, on the ground for such a time as this in Jerusalem. He's just got such great information, Governor, as you just heard. But look, I think the Biden administration, what will their posture be here is a big question I've been thinking about over the past several hours. And when we talk about that Israeli response, Governor, a word that the Biden administration has used a bunch over the months vis-a-vis -vis Iran and its proxies is, look, if we're attacked, when we're attacked, we'll have a, quote, proportionate response. So I'm a little concerned that the administration right now may be saying to Israel, look, don't go overboard. You need to have a proportionate response. We shall see if Israel heeds that advice uh, from the administration. Governor, a little while ago, right before I came on with you, I was on the horn with someone close to the prime minister's office in Israel, and I asked about that. I asked about U.S. pressure, and this source did not directly address the White House and what they're saying right now behind the scenes, but the source did say, quote, this is not over. <laughs> and again, made the point that this is indeed an unprecedented attack uh, against Israel. And by the way, look, the U.S., thankfully, the administration is stepping into the fray and helping to intercept these rockets, missiles, 
drones, saying all the right things right now, but I'm just looking at the moment of truth, which is coming when Israel, when this when these waves, these Iranian waves end eventually at some point in the middle of the night, and then it's a stalemate, and Israel says, okay, we were just attacked by another nation, nation nation-to-nation governor, for the first time since 1991, when Saddam Hussein launched Scud missiles from Iraq at Tel Aviv and killed several Israelis, by the way, at that time, Israel stayed its hand. Israel did not respond because if you remember, everyone watching, there was an international coalition, including some Arab nations, and the U.S. said, look, Israel, we will respond to Saddam Hussein. You don't do it because if you do, it will break up the coalition. Well, it's a new day now in 2024, and Israel has no such restraints. But a key point here, Every time Israel's been attacked since then, since 1991, those Iraqi scuds, it's been terror groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the various jihadi groups in the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria. Now it's nation to nation. We really haven't seen this since 1973, Governor, since the Yom Kippur War, when Israel was invaded on all sides. Now, Iran's not invading on the ground, but it's nation to nation, and all bets are off in terms of what comes next in the world's most volatile and chaotic region, the Middle East. And by the way, if there's anything we've learned, Governor, it's that what happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. And number one, every American has a stake in this because there could very well be ripple effects. But number two, for me as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, I have a biblical mandate to stand with the people of Israel And I'm going to do exactly that. I know we are here, our team at TBN will as well right now. In Israel's moment of greatest need, Israel could use a few good friends, but Israel also has the ultimate trump card, and that's the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So at the end of the day, when the dust settles, Israel will be just fine. You know, I think a lot of people uh, may not understand the history of the wars that have gone against Israel. But in every case, there's no explanation for the victory of Israel other than divine intervention. And I'm glad you brought that up because whether it was 48, 56, 67, 73, the Yom Kippur War, by the way, 73, that was my first trip to Israel, three months before the Yom Kippur War. I was there in July. The Yom Kippur War started in October. Obviously, I did not realize that I was simply a few weeks away from being in the middle of a war zone. No one did. Uh, It was a surprise attack uh, against Israel in October on uh, Yom Kippur. But in every one of those wars, there are just incredible stories of nothing short of miraculous intervention in which Israel was down for the count. And in some cases, there are inexplicable interventions uh, that defy all really logic and rational thinking. And the only explanation is, as Forrest Gump so brilliantly said, and God showed up. And I think for many of us, we're looking at what's going on even tonight in Israel, and we're certainly praying that God will show up. I personally am convinced that not only he will, but that he is. And in part, he's showing up by even bringing into this fight on behalf of Israel those who were once its absolute mortal enemies. Because I think a lot of them understand that Iran is not interested in just destroying Israel. Iran is a radical Shiite Muslim nation, and they hate the Sunni Muslims just about as much as they hate the Jews. And so if you're a Saudi or if you're an Emirati, uh, you're going to be looking at this and say, you know, if if Iran is able to establish a foothold, if they're able to do something of consequence and uh, whether or not destroy Israel or just deeply wound them, it gives uh, the Iranians a great boost of power, something that the world cannot afford to have. So, Eric, you mentioned the word proportionate a moment ago, and I think that that may be one of the dumbest words that the Americans have ever put forth in the public square to talk about a proportionate response. Because proportion, if somebody's trying to kill you, but they fail, is not simply attempting to kill them and wound them. Proportionate response is to make sure they never have the opportunity to do that again. 
So it's necessary to deliver not simply uh, a hurtful wound, but rather to deliver a mortal wound that forever ends their capacity to come at you like that again. And, and I think that was a, an excellent point that you made. Yeah, and Governor, you know, the proportionate conversation really went into overdrive after October 7th. There should have been apparently a proportionate response to the slaughter of 1,200 men, women, and children in the worst massacre since the Holocaust. That's what much of the world has said. Governor, I know Yair Pinto, our TBN Israel correspondent, is still with us on the ground in Jerusalem. Yair, if you're still there, my friend, look, you were in Khan Yunus. Just so people know, you were filing reports for us here on TBN, exclusive reports from the belly of the beast. You were inside Gaza, in Khan Yunus, uh, in Gaza City. Give us an idea. When you were on the ground for months, away from your family, bravely serving the nation of Israel in the IDF, give us an idea, maybe some of the weapons that you saw there. Were the Iranian fingerprints apparent? Because, look, I believe October 7th does not happen without Iran's active support, arming, training of Hamas. Was that kind of Iranian support apparent? I know I've been in Israel in the past. Some of the rockets that fell inside Israel, there was actually Farsi writing on those rockets. And that's the Iranian language, the Persian language on those rockets. Did you see anything like that when you were in Gaza? Yes, Eric. So, so inside the Gaza Strip, I saw a few things. First of all, the whole Gaza Strip is not just a place that people lived in. It was basically a base, a base for terrorists. Everything, every house, every step that I took in the Gaza Strip was prepared for the Israeli entrance there. It was all pre-thought, planned and they invested all the money of the Gazan people into building this Gaza Strip to make it a terrorist state with traps, with underground terrorist tunnels. Every second house that looks like a normal house was designed to be launching missiles at our troops. And yes, inside schools, inside kindergartens, we saw weapons stockpiles. And these weapons were either made by Iran or made by Russia, okay, AK-47s, RPGs, and then the missiles that were either made by Iran or the training that the militants and the terrorists of Hamas underwent were trained by Iranians in Iran. So the Hamas militants had a special way of going outside of Gaza, through Syria, through Lebanon, Hezbollah, and being trained by the Revolutionary Guards, then went back inside the Gaza Strip to be able to execute these operations, either develop the weapons inside the Gaza Strip with the Iranian training and the methods, or carry inside the weapons from Iran with them. So you can see Iranian hands and fingerprints all over the Gaza Strip. And one more point, you talked about, about Iranians being Shia, hating the Sunnis more than almost as much as they hate the Israelis. But it's not happening in the Gaza Strip because the Palestinians inside the Gaza Strip and Hamas are mainly Sunni. So it seems like when yeah. you're talking about Israel, everybody are friends. Everybody are best friends as long as they have the enemy, which is Israel. And this is biblical. This is not just physical war. This is also a spiritual war, and I can feel it inside the Gaza Strip. I can feel it now. This is bigger than just a normal war between countries. It is. It's literally a and battle. And in many ways, here, I think it's probably a... Go ahead. Go ahead, Governor. Sorry. I, I was just saying that as Yair was describing this, I, I couldn't agree more. You cannot really look at this conflict and think that it is primarily military, economic, sociological, even religious. It is uh, a deeply uh, heavenly versus hell fight. It is evil versus good. Uh, when I was in Israel in December and walked into the kibbutzim that had been attacked on October the 7th and visited with hostage families and survivors of October 7th, it became quite evident that what was experienced by the Jewish people of Israel that day 
was not like anything that you would typically see in a war, in a conflict. It did reek of a level of evil that can only be described as having originated in the very bowels of hell itself. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I could be. And this is Isaiah exactly what these times. I Keep going, Eric. Go ahead, Geyer. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the prophet Isaiah, we're talking about this being a spiritual battle. We battle not against flesh and blood, but spirits and principalities ultimately. But the prophet Isaiah talked about a day where good is called evil and evil is called good. Well, welcome to 2024, where we have Hamas supporters right here in the United States. I say all that to say, I believe there's really no gray areas here. Uh, This is, Governor, as you said very rightly, and Yair, you said it as well, it's a battle of good versus evil. And Yair, you made another great point. You mentioned Iran and Russia and their hidden hand, or should we say not so hidden hand, behind Hamas in Gaza. For everyone watching right now, every American, this is your fight as well. I, I call it a gathering storm against America. Iran, Russia, North Korea, China. You can call them, in a sense, the gathering storm coalition. And guess what? They not only like Israel, but they have a bullseye on the back of the United States. Remember, in that Iranian ideology, Israel is only the little Satan, in their words. America is still, in their view, the great Satan. This is a global struggle, and we can't just bury our heads in the sand and be ostriches and believe that it doesn't affect us. And I believe, Governor Yair, thanks so much. Great job. Stay safe. We're praying for you. I believe we have our good friend Joel Rosenberg, host of the Rosenberg Report, right here on TBN, joining us from Jerusalem. Joel, first of all, how are you? What is the state of play right now for you in your home in Jerusalem? Great to be with you, Eric. Uh, and uh, we're doing okay. We're safe. But I, I will tell you, this has been the, the most, or certainly one of the most, top three maybe, surreal moments I've had uh, with my family here since we moved to Israel uh, 10 years ago. We've been dual U.S. Israeli citizens for 10 years, meaning we've had rocket attacks in the past. We've had sirens going off here in Jerusalem, as we did, for example, on October 7th, um, when we did a live report for uh, uh, the Rosenberg Report on TBM that night, because we'd had eight rounds of missiles inbound to Jerusalem. But here's the difference, Eric. These missiles and drones were coming from the east. Whenever we've been attacked in Jerusalem, which is not as often, obviously, as in Tel Aviv or other places closer to the Gaza Strip, the rockets are coming um, from the west, or the southwest, in, in terms of us here in Jerusalem. So we don't actually see the rockets if we're in our home, maybe if we're out you know, shopping or going someplace. But these are, we have never, ever... In 37 years of me coming and traveling to this country and 10 years living here, ever seen rockets and missiles coming from the east. We saw them exploding uh, over our home. And over the Temple Mount, by the way, Joel, we saw stunning footage yeah. right above the Temple Mount of projectiles exploding, thankfully being intercepted. Joel, I think one big takeaway from tonight, and the night is anything but over. As you know, you're you're in the belly of the beast right now. The fact that Jordan and Saudi Arabia, you have done so much great work on the ground in the Sunni Arab world, meeting with leaders in these nations, the Abraham Accords nations, obviously. We've covered the Abraham Accords extensively here on TBN. But Jordan and Saudi Arabia stepping up and actually helping Israel and the U.S. and the U.K. to intercept these incoming Iranian and, and Iranian proxy rockets, missiles, drones. How big is that? It's huge, uh, Eric. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are in uncharted territory, okay? First, there's never been in the history of the modern state of Israel, the prophetic rebirth of Israel in 48, we've never, ever had actual missile and drone and cruise missile attacks from Iranian soil. So that's never happened, uh, totally unprecedented. Second, We've never had an alliance in which the United States and Israel and our Sunni Arab partners, peace partners, have worked together to shoot down uh, these Iranian uh, missiles and drones. And that is a big deal. First of all, there wasn't the technology back, you know, you recall 
Uh, we really haven't had an attack on Jerusalem from the east since the Gulf War of 1991, when uh, Saddam Hussein fired dozens of uh, ballistic missiles at Israel. And that was coming, of course, from Iraq, from the east. Um, but at the time, it was a very rudimentary American Patriot missile system, which shot down some of them. Jordan didn't have that technology at the time. The Saudis had American technology, but they weren't trying to protect Israel, right? So this is a big deal at multiple levels. And I think the big question here with more than 200, okay, the Israelis have confirmed now more than 200 Iranian ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and killer drones were fired tonight. Um, what happens next, right? The, the, the Israeli war cabinet yeah. is just fit, rep, wrapping up hours of meetings. Uh, Netanyahu just finished a call with uh, President Biden. The big question is, what is Israel going to do next? Yeah, that is a big question, Joe. And, and Governor, you and That's I and weather. Joe, we've all spent extensive time in, in northern Israel. And could that be the new front? Look, Gaza obviously has been in the main focus since October 7th. But it seems, Governor and Joel, look, the north of Israel, Lebanon, Syria, could that be the new coming, I've called it the Great Northern War. It seems like a collision course there to Israel's north. Do we see a step in that direction after the events of tonight? Well, uh, I'm happy to, to answer that question. Look, I think we have to put tonight in the context of the last six months. We've been at war nonstop in the north, uh, really within hours of the October 7th invasion in the south from Gaza by Hamas, uh, Hezbollah erupted. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, tonight um, was precipitated because Israel took out two Iranian top generals from the IRGC in Syria, right? So Syria and Lebanon really aren't sovereign countries anymore. They're effectively forward operating bases and protectorates, provinces of the Iranian regime. And that's the danger, right? Uh, and you don't even have to go prophetic, right, to talk about Ezekiel 38 or 39. You just talk about actual geopolitical analysis. Those, you know, Iran and, and, and uh, sorry, Syria and Lebanon aren't sovereign countries. They're effectively taken over by I Iran's regime. And, and so Israel is fighting that. And, and the escalation in recent days and weeks of dozens and dozens and dozens of missiles coming in from Lebanon, from Hezbollah, means that we are now seeing Israel pull whole divisions. In fact, most ground forces have been pulled out of Israel and they're being sent north. It's just lines and, and miles and miles of, of tanks have been moved up north because Israel believes the big next fight is in the north. Joel, I'd like Don't to jump in and there. ask about the, yeah, I, I was just going to ask Joel to describe the resolve of the Israeli people, because here in the United States, we are seeing enormous pressure placed on President Biden. We're watching people like Chuck Schumer, who historically have been reliable allies of Israel, calling for a full ceasefire, which would be a disaster, would have given Hamas a decisive victory. In the light of these Iranian attacks, and even before, what's the resolve of the Israeli people? Not necessarily the prime minister, which we feel he's very resolved, but on the streets of Israel, do the people realize what they're up against and are they ready with or without the help of the United States to take it all the way home? It's a great question, Governor, and I'm so grateful that you were here uh, with me uh, in December as we met with the prime minister, of course, but also visited those uh, those Israeli towns have been savaged by Hamas. Israelis are strong. You, you, you do not see panic in this country right now. If, if, if the United States was attacked by 200 uh, Iranian missiles and drones, there would be, people would be freaking out. But uh, Israelis are taking this in stride. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of division here over whether uh, Netanyahu's time is up. But but that's not the that's not the topic tonight, and 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 on a day to day basis, that's not what people are focused on. What they're focused on is we want the country unified to win. But people are horrified here, not by Iran. We expect this from Iran. They're horrified by Biden, because Biden has become schizophrenic. Yes, Israelis believe that he loves us at at a, at a core level, 
But Biden has been sending every signal in the world that there's enormous daylight between Washington and Jerusalem. Uh, Biden has been using language that we can't say on Christian television to, to describe Prime Minister Netanyahu. I mean, just obscenities. Biden doesn't use that language against Russian President Vladimir Putin or Chinese Premier Xi Jinping, right? It, so Biden is using ob obscene language to describe his revulsion with the democratically elected government and leader of Israel while we're in a hot war that now is getting worse. And Iran, I believe, thinks that there's so much daylight that they can exploit it. Now, maybe tonight we'll actually pull Netanyahu and Biden together, but they've had their first phone call in, in I think, over a month or two. That would have been very interesting to listen in on that call, Biden, who's been literally swearing about uh, Netanyahu in public, now realizes, oh, gosh, this is an ally I have to stand with. So we're wrapping up here soon, but in about a minute or so, you could we could probably go on about this for an hour, Israel's response. No one knows what it's going to be, obviously, but do you see this almost as a unique window for Israel in that, look, Iran has been a thorn in Israel's side for years and years, and now Iran has done it. They've directly attacked Israel. It seems Israel has a unique and perhaps golden opportunity to really make the Iranian regime feel consequences here. In about a minute, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I will tell you, my perspective has shifted a bit from living in Washington for 24 years to living here. I think, meaning, I think Netanyahu and, you know, Benny Gantz uh, and, and, and the whole team in the war cabinet, they realize how dangerous it is to get in a full-scale war with Iran. And yet... If, if Israel has now been attacked for the first time by 200 ballistic missiles and drones, you know, if there was ever a moment to go take out Iran's nuclear facility and take out the Iran defense ministry and take out the Hamanai homes, this would be the week to do it. Yeah. Joel, we are watching. Joel, watching thank you. Closely, but we'll have you back, my friend. Thank you. Host of the Rosenberg Report, Joel, thank you so much. And Governor, unprecedented times, right, as we're great to see you. Governor, unprecedented times we are witnessing right now. And I, for me, as we're getting close to closing out this great special program here on TBN, breaking news, I just want to encourage people, Governor, and say, look, God is still on the throne. Uh, amid all the madness, the chaos, the God of Israel, the Bible says he neither slumbers nor sleeps when it comes to Israel. That's number one. And number two, I love Psalms 2, Governor, which said, God hears the schemes of Israel's enemies, and he laughs. So Israel will be just fine no matter what this night brings and the next few days bring, Governor. Well, I think that's a great perspective for us to conclude on tonight, Eric. And as we started tonight, we spoke of the fact that it was four in the morning in Israel. It's almost five o'clock in the morning. The Israelis haven't slept. They've been hearing bombs sirens, the sound of the Iron Dome intercepting what could be their last moment on earth. And if God does intervene, and I believe he will, then all of us can not only pray for, but we will see the peace of Jerusalem. All of us here at TBN are deeply grateful for your joining us for this special report dealing with Israel under attack from Iran. We hope that you will keep it right here on TBN. Good night and God bless.